What's up, everyone? Today, I'm going to do a shootout between four of the world's most infamous and popular limiters, FabFilter Pro L2, DMG Limitless, Isotope Ozone Maximizer, and Sonable Smart Limit. And for good measure, I'm going to throw a hard clipper in there so you can hear the differences between hard clipping and fast limiting. Disclaimer right up front, if you're not into drum and bass and, and loud, aggressive bass music, if that's not your thing, uh, don't say I didn't warn you. Let's have a listen to the limiters. All right, there's a there's a quick ABCX test between them. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know what you're hearing. Uh, over the next few minutes, I'm going to dissect what's going on inside of each one of these limiters, how I've set them up, the settings that I'm using. And uh, a couple of things I wanted to say up front is I'm using these limiters in a very, very aggressive way. I'm pushing them and making them sweat. This is not how I master music, okay? I use other effects before my limiter and I use special techniques in my mix, that's where it all starts, that allow me to not use very much limiting at the mastering stage. But in kind of benchmarking these limiters against each other, it's, it's I think, much better to actually push some gain reduction in them. And also that is how most producers, I think, in these genres are using these limiters. They're pushing the limiters quite heavily to achieve loudness at the mastering stage. So I'm simulating, I think, how they will be used out in the wild. So let's check out each one of the limiters and how I'm setting them up. Starting off, we're going to use FabFilter Pro L2. It is a, a really common limiter. I think this is probably the most common limiter aside from maybe Ozone Maximizer that a lot of people are using. It's the first limiter that was a professional limiter that I started using. It's a single band limiter. Uh, once you get to know it, it's really quick to dial in the settings. In general, I love the FabFilter stuff. Um, however, it's not the limiter that I use the most anymore, but I always test it in my lineup because sometimes I get surprised. The limiter that I might think is going to perform the best actually doesn't, and then a limiter I didn't think was going to win the day actually sounds better. So, so you really do benefit from trying out different limiters on your specific program material. How do I have this set up? I set every single one of the limiters to push 5 dB into the ceiling. Okay, so I, apples to apples as much as possible here. Not all of these limiters are single band and they have different features that will affect the sound a little bit. So it's not a 100% apples to apples comparison, but I've tried to match them as closely as possible. Okay, so 5 dB of gain for each one of the limiters. I'm using the aggressive style. It suits the genre. Uh, sometimes I start with modern and see how that sounds for electronic music and bass music. However, drum and bass, uh, aggressive. It, it changes the release behavior of the, of the envelope. Okay, look ahead 0 0.1. That's kind of the, we're verging into distortion clipping territory. Definitely, we're going to get some distortion with settings like these, but in drum and bass, it's oftentimes masked by the amount of saturation and distortion that's actually in the song. So you can get away with a bit more distortion and faster limiting settings. So yeah, this is a very fast look ahead, but it's just enough where you're, you're going to avoid getting crunchy distortion. Okay. Um, you might want to try 0 0.2 milliseconds, maybe 0 0.5. That might be a little long for aggressive music. Um, I wouldn't really go south of 0 0.1 because now you're in clipping territory. And if you're going to do that, use a clipper don't don't use pro l2 as a clipper okay use use a nice clipper like gold clip so attack and release settings this is for the release stage of the limiter and, and if some of this stuff you want to deep dive on this i just filmed a video called how modern limiters actually work and it's a deep dive into each one of these settings and the fact that this limiter is actually three or four limiters in one it's not just one limiter uh, when you look under the hood link in the description for that okay I set the attack backed off a little bit so it's not going to be touching the transients. Again, this is louder to set the attack longer. Why didn't I set it longer than 400 milliseconds? Well, that has to do with Sonable's limiter and the fact that the maximum attack time on the transient or on the dynamic stage of that limiter is 400. You can't go higher than that. So I, again, tried to get apples to apples. And then the release, I set all the limiters to a 75 millisecond release if they have a release parameter, not all of the limiters have a dedicated release parameter in milliseconds that you can dial in. I used zero transient linking and zero release linking for the, the channel linking. And that is because that's louder. 
right? And in this genre, people push for maximum loudness. You might not agree with that. Go argue with the drum and bass genre itself, not me. <laughs> so I'm just doing what people in the genre do, the type of engineering that's done. Channel linking uh, can tilt your stereo image uh, if you have a big, loud something in the left or the right, right? Um, but that's not the case with this mix. So uh, zero channel linking is great. I'm using 4x oversampling. Again, to reduce the amount of aliasing foldback uh, that's being created by fast limiting settings, but also because um, not all of these limiters have oversampling, and then some of them have oversampling that you can't turn off. So the Sonable limiter, it has oversampling going on underneath the hood, and you cannot deactivate it. So I figured where the limiter has oversampling, I'm going to turn oversampling on. And a quick note about oversampling, anything more than 4x oversampling is uh, not necessary. Uh, I've talked to Sonable and their team, and they did crazy extensive research into how much oversampling is going to yield a benefit, and then anything more than that is just unnecessary. 4x oversampling. That's also supported by two other sources. One of them is the ITU that specifies true peak limiting, says that it, a true peak limiter must be 4x oversampling, so there isn't benefit over that. And then also Nicholas DiLorenzo from Panorama Mixing and Mastering, he did a test himself and also concluded that 4x was the, really the where it maxes out. And anything more than that, you're going to like, you know, 32x oversampling. Overkill. Don't need it. Okay. Um, and then I put the output on the limiter to negative 0.1. This is not for streaming sites. This is not being rendered for a compressed format like AAC. This is for wave file render and it's for DJ play. That's the intended destination. You want it loud. So I'm not leaving a 1 dB limiter margin and I'm not using true peak limiting. Okay, so that is the setup. And then we have loudness monitoring over here. You can go momentary short-term integrated. I monitor my loudness in the drops only. So I have a loop set up for my drop and I monitor my loudness based on integrated luffs during the drop sections only. So I'm getting, again, apples to apples at the loudest parts of the song. And you can reset the loudness meter like going like that. So let's just listen um, to, to Pro L2. Yeah, right on. Now, I have a plugin by Sonable called True Level um, after every one of the limiters. So you can see where the loudness is coming out again, confirmed by a second plugin. And you can see the True Peak. You know, I don't, for the most part, I don't care about True Peaks. That's a whole other video that I will do at some point. But uh, I just want to show you that the 4x oversampling is actually very effectively suppressing uh, True Peaks because that's what True Peak limiting is actually doing. If you engage True Peak limiting, it's engaging another limiter behind Pro L2. And in the case of FabFilter Pro L2, it's an 8x uh, oversampling rate. Um, I don't know why they use 8x, but they do. So uh, very effectively suppressing True Peaks with the oversampling and also suppressing additional distortion, I think. Right on. Okay, let's look at uh, limiter number two. Limiter number two. Now this, I will say, is the limiter that I favor in most cases. Um, it is a complicated, deep limiter to get to know. And uh, for that reason, I think a lot of people shy away from it, especially when it looks like this, like a freaking monster. <laughs> you know, if you want to make it less scary, uh, go like this. Um, but I want to show you how I'm using Limitless because I think that it is one of the top limiters on the planet. And uh, I think that it offers advantages um, that some of the other limiters that I'm going to show you don't, don't have. Each one is unique and has uh, neat features. So uh, I've chosen each one of these carefully because I actually use all four of these. Okay, So uh, you don't have a gain that you push up into the uh into a fixed ceiling you actually have a ceiling called threshold that you drop down and then it compensates by pushing up the loudness afterwards up to zero dbfs that's just a slight workflow difference in how this works ceiling this is your output volume you can drop the ceiling down and it has no influence on the amount of limiting that is very important to understand because not all limiters work like that some limiters if you pull the ceiling down are going to introduce more limiting so you have to understand that parameter and in this case Negative 0.1 is where we're benchmarking for all the limiters. Release, you can see this limiter doesn't have an attack setting. Um, not too sure why for the, for the uh, dynamic section. Maybe Dave Gamble can <laughs> explain to me why it doesn't need an attack. Uh, they're doing it underneath the hood, I think, based on the style that you've chosen. And um, the release 75 milliseconds is consistent with what I said in Pro L2. 
Okay. Now this is a very different animal than ozone and uh, and any of the other limiters because this is a uh, multiband limiter. Ozone can be set as a the maximizer can be set as a multiband as well, but um, this is uh, multiband straight out of the box without changing any settings. And I like that because the approach in this limit limiter is to minimize the amount of gain reduction that is necessary in each one of the bands. And if you're careful about how you set it up, um, then you're not going to get noticeable changes in the spectral balance of your mix. The downside to using anything multiband or spectral in limiters is that if it's changing how much gain reduction is happening on each band's band dramatically, it can make your mix sound re-EQ'd. Okay, not, not necessarily a good thing. So how am I setting this up? I am leaving most of the things alone. Separation tells you how much band independence there is, and I'm leaving that at default. If I wanted it to function more like a single band limiter, then I would reduce separation. That's one of the ways to do it. Okay. And, uh, but I'm just going to leave it at default. So it's going to be allowing it to manipulate each one of the bands independently. That's what each one of these are for, uh, for each one of the bands and how much limiting is happening that you can have band dependent release. You can see the release is scaled. So faster release in the upper bands, longer release in the lower bands. Makes sense. It's kind of a neat feature. Okay. Um, look ahead, 0 0.1 milliseconds, just like the other limiter. Um, when it, where there is a look ahead parameter and not all of the limiters have it, um, I'm setting it to 0 0.1 milliseconds. So it's fast, aggressive limiting, but ideally keeping away from clipping and distortion. No knee. Waiting. Um, waiting is a really neat parameter, especially when it comes to bass music, because when you have it set at 100, it's going to optimize for perceptual loudness, which means oftentimes that it's going to penalize the bass a little bit if it needs to. Not always what you want. So if you take it to negative 100, it's going to optimize for bass and it'll be reducing the level of the bass less, but loudness is going to go down because bass and loudness are kind of on opposite sides of the table, right? You can have bass or you can have maximum loudness. It's difficult to have both. So um, I, I would play with this parameter and adjust it maybe south of 100% if I feel like it's penalizing the bass too much and it needs more bass. Let's just have a listen with that. Let's uh, use the states. So this plugin has a, a, a really amazing feature. It has these number of states uh, that you can, if you're changing between. And when I'm using a mastering limiter, I am always testing between very slight changes in parameters to see which yields a better effect. So I'm going to go copy to B. Okay, now I'm going to go to the B state, and I'm going to change the B state to be negative 100, which is going to optimize for bass instead of perceptual loudness. Now we can go back and forth between them. Neat, hey, to have that control. I'm going to leave it at 100 because that, I think is letting it be at a similar level of loudness to the other limiters. If I was trying to master a hip hop track where I really want the 808 to breathe, that would be a scenario where I'd go down to negative 100 or maybe negative 50 with this parameter. Release shape, that's another one. Um, it has the ability to swing the release shape between a inverted log and a regular log, logarithmic. Uh, and if you go in between, it's going to be more linear. So I had it set at 50% here, which is going to give me a linear release shape. And then dynamics is another really important parameter in, under the hood here. And it determines how much of the gain reduction is going to be handled by the transient stage. And it is brick wall and it's very fast. In this case, the transient stage is going to be the look ahead of 0 0.1. And it also is going to have a release of 0 0.1 milliseconds. The release of the transient stage is the same as the look ahead. And uh, this is going to give you a percentage if it's zero percent then limitless is going to be 100 percent handled by the transient stage of the limiter not really what i want now if i put this up further up to 100 then it's going to have more of the limiting be handled by the dynamics stage so usually for really loud stuff i go south of 50 percent somewhere between 50 percent 25 percent is usually where i wind up okay so yeah, there we are, and, and let's just fire off Limitless and you can have a, have a good listen to it. Blaster. 
Now, the final thing I'll say about Limitless is Limitless does not have oversampling. I've talked about this on the channel before, but that should make you really, really, really curious. If you think that oversampling is needed for a mastering grade effect, or if you think that oversampling, using oversampling, always equates to less distortion and higher quality, that would be wrong. And let me explain why. Uh, I had a really long talk with uh, Dave Gamble, one of the developers of uh, Limitless and one of the owners of DMG, about his approach because I was looking through the manual and I was searching for oversampling and I couldn't find it. And I was like, where is oversampling in this limiter? And his reply to me went a little something like this. I'm paraphrasing. He said, you know, one way to deal with aliasing, which is really what oversampling is intended to address, is to use oversampling in a, and you downsample and you're able to reduce or minimize aliasing foldback. He said the other approach to dealing with aliasing is not to cause it in the first place. <laughs> Go, go figure, hey? And so their approach with Limitless was to use a calculation approach that minimized the abruptness of game gain on each individual sample. So a limiter produces distortion when there's abrupt changes in gain. A limiter is basically a volume knob with a massive brain attached to it, okay? And the smoother you can make the necessary gain changes, the less distortion and thus the less aliasing you get. And so his approach, DMG's approach, rather than using oversampling, which is very CPU intensive, causes latency, and there's lots of downsides to it, uh, they designed an algorithm that just produces less distortion in the first place. And part of that is that they're spreading gain reduction over the bands in the multiband setup such that um, it's minimizing and, and spreading it in a way that it doesn't generate as much distortion. And it, I agree, this limiter generates very, very, very low amounts of distortion, lower distortion than other limiters that are using oversampling in some cases when I've tested it in Plugin Doctor. I'm not going to make you look at Plugin Doctor today. Um, okay, the final thing I'll say about uh, Limitless is the bands. They have crossovers, right? What are those crossovers made of? They're made of cascading Butterworth filters, like you would expect. They're Linkwitz Riley crossovers, if you want to look up what those are, if you don't know. Uh, Linkwitz Riley, they're, they're a way to make a flat crossover network so that it's not changing the frequency response by the phase shift of the filters or by the the cuts of the filters and uh, these filters are linear phase so for those of you that are freaked out about using linear phase filters on a master because you've been programmed by people on youtube to think that linear phase filters are the devil and that they always cause horrible audible pre-ringing well this is a world-class flagship mastering limiter and they've used linear phase filters just saying um, I use this limiter all the time. Thousands of other mastering engineers and really high profile artists use this limiter. And, uh, if you're hearing horrible pre-ringing on all of those records, let me know. Cause I am not. So, uh, that should make you a little curious about, uh, the viability of using limit, uh, linear phase filters. Uh, okay. So now let's go and check out ozone. When I first started, um, producing I used ozone a lot, and then I kind of got out of the habit of using it. And I've just started using it again, mainly to test against other limiters. And uh, a lot of mastering engineers that I uh, respect, uh, Nicholas DiLorenzo, one of them, uh, really sings praises of, of ozone. So uh, we're using the maximizer, which is the limiter in ozone. And uh, let's have a listen to that. The Okay, so how have I set this up? I have um, used the IRC. IRC stands for Intelligent Release Control, and they do some really funky stuff underneath the hood, some stuff that they've patented, I believe, that is based on psychoacoustic research to be able to optimize perceptual loudness. Wow, that was a mouthful. <laughs> um, the IRC3 is, is what I use mostly. Uh, if you go to IRC4, then that is multiband it's going to actually be able to limit more like limitless and address the band. So maybe if later on in this video, I'll compare limitless versus ozone in IRC4. Okay, because then we're comparing multiband to multiband. But for now, I'm going to leave it on IRC3 crisp, which I really like. Uh, I'm pushing 5 dB of gain up. So it's the same amount of gain into the limiter. I have set the output level to negative 0.1, just like the other limiters. I'm not using true peak. And uh, I've set the character to, this is setting the uh, attack and release, definitely controlling the speed. And I've set this so that it's roughly on par 
with the the other limiters as well and, and yielding about the same level of loudness okay that's how i've set it up this limiter is really simple i think it's a great limiter for beginners because there's not a lot you can fuss with a lot of it is happening underneath the hood for me that's one of the reasons why i don't gravitate towards this limiter as much because i feel like i'm the type of person who wants to go under the hood but you can't argue with the results and i think it sounds pretty good the last thing i will say is this like limitless is one of the limiters that i don't think has oversampling at least i can't find any mention of oversampling in its manual at all except with respect to their soft clipper that does have oversampling that you can engage um however on the main limiter nothing about oversampling okay so let's have a listen here and uh check out how it sounds now uh, i will also point out where i think features are missing and uh if we take a look at pro l you can see it has an a b state if we take a look at limitless it's got a to uh, h states now if we look at ozone maximizer nothing i might i might be missing this and if somebody else knows that this has states somewhere that i'm not seeing please let me know so i reached out to ian stewart on this and luckily he filmed us a little clip to set the record straight thanks ian drew what's up dude a picture is worth a thousand words um right so yeah this is just gonna be a little easier to show you so yeah if you come into ozone you click on this little uh, history button here, you get your history window. But you basically just have to set them. You, you can see you've got uh, set A, B, C, and D. So you've got two better than A, B comparison. You kind of got to set them in the order that you want to recall them because it's tied to the history. So let's say, um, you know, this one I want to check, try a few different gain levels on my high band of the compressor here, right? So I could say set that as A. I want to try pulling down. You know, by half a dB, we're just going to reset that as B, and then down by, you know, be a little more draconian, 2 dB, right? And now I can just jump between those um, and and pretty quickly compare, you know, what that sounds like. Right, so you can jump around. You got four states there to play with. So, so yeah, there is a way to do that. And that'll that'll work for, I mean, right now I'm in the mothership, right? I've just got the dynamics module open. Um, but if I could have whole chains, right, I could do a chain with, I don't know, I'm just picking random stuff, right? I could say set that as A, set that as B, I think. Yeah, right. You can jump between entirely different chains here. Anyway, hope you're well, dude. Later. One of the key things that I want to do as an engineer is I want to compare what does IRC3 sound like versus IRC4 modern? What does fast and loud sound like versus a more relaxed uh, release and attack behavior now sonable now i said that uh, ozone was a, a good limiter for beginners well i actually would say that smart limit is the best limiter for beginners because despite the fact that it uh, gives you a, quite a complicated uh, looking interface it's a great interface but it there's a lot of stuff going on um you can make this limiter so simple because it is what you call a content aware limiter and it can learn a song and just set everything for you so that that's awesome but like me if you're a guy who wants to get under the hood and fuss with parameters you have full control you have full control over everything okay so how i set this up was uh smart limit has these profiles and it actually is another one of the reasons why i'm like yes guys you did a great job here you actually have not just an electronic profile like some plugins that have styles they just give you electronic well i mean like house music's pretty different than drum and bass bro so uh yeah it's nice that they give you bass music versus edm versus house techno all that stuff right um yeah so i i set it to bass music and then i clicked learn and played it in and it changed all the settings for me so it can be as simple as that if you're new to using mastering limiters now that's not me and i have said several times now i love getting under the hood so i changed the settings that it made to conform it to what the other limiters are doing so i set 400 millisecond attack time you just do that by dragging this five decibels of gain into the limiter and i set the release behavior to 75 milliseconds one of the things that it did to conform it to electronic bass music was set auto release and that was actually making it um less loud 
it was making it quieter because I think the auto release was you know, it's program dependent and it was using a longer release time than uh, than I wanted. So I just uh, I just took over manual control, which is great. And then, uh, well, before I say anything else, let's just let's just have a listen. Okay, so two things to realize about this limiter. One is it has oversampling going on underneath the hood. You don't see it. You don't have any control over it. They're just doing it at different stages, upsampling and downsampling. So it's a black box. Um, what it's doing, I think, is really good. It's based on a lot of hard work and research by their team. So I don't mind that. But uh, just know that there's nowhere to go and, and activate or deactivate or change the oversampling. It's all just happening underneath the hood. And the other thing that's happening is this is a true peak limiter. Um, I've asked their team because I've heard that there is a way to turn off true peak limiting in this, but I haven't found it yet. So I've asked their team, and maybe I'll flash a little text up on the screen uh, if they, I hear back from them to confirm that. So I did hear back from them, and there was an update version 1.1.5 that was available. And in that version, you can go expand the loudness monitoring area, and you see true peak off. I just didn't have that version installed for this video. Now, um... This also has distortion monitoring. It will show you in red if there's distortion and oh, there's going to be distortion. That's just part of this style. But you you can check out what that looks like. It's it's quite useful. Nice. And then one of the other features where if you do get into some manual changes, but you still have this selected as a target, you can hit this quality check and it's going to give you tips on, on uh, how to change the settings. Yeah, so it gives you tips and uh, shows you on screen what it thinks you should do that can guide you in your mastering decisions. Uh, again, if you're feeling uh, like you're new to this and you and you want that, uh, it's nice to have a plugin that, that just talks to you. Okay, um, channel linking. I, I left this at 75. That was default. Let's actually take it to zero so that we're comparing that uh, like we would with the other limiters. Okay, and then speaking of different states, if you want to compare the states, like if I wanted to compare channel linking, right? We have 75. To compare states, you just take this state, drag it onto the next one. So now we have state two, and you can change that to zero, and you can flip back and forth between them. And I like this even better than limitless because limitless, you have a drop down, and it's kind of clunky to shift between these quickly. And I don't like that as much, but in Sonable, Boom, you can just, boom, they're all on the front interface. Okay, so let's have a listen with channel linking on and off. Yeah, right on. And you can see because it has true peak limiting on, we're staying under zero dB true peak with the metering. Okay, nice. Now, the clipper. So I'm using K-Clip. Why am I using a clipper? I mean, I have to state up front. I never use a clipper like this. I never use a clipper uh, on the master that's clipping this much. But I wanted to show you the difference in sound between using a hard clipper and using a limiter. Because if you use limiters with really, 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 really fast settings, they approach the sound of hard clipping, okay? So let's go back and forth between K-Clip and uh, maybe Pro-L2. Like horrible, horrible, hot garbage when you use a clipper like that. Okay, it's a total abuse of a clipper. To be honest, it's really short-sighted. I do unfortunately see some people using clippers like this on the master. And the problems with this are if you leave use, doing gain reduction to the master, you've completely messed up your mix. 
loudness, the capacity for loudness, happens in the mix by using clippers where and when possible on the individual sounds in your mix. Using a clipper on your master is just like, yeah, you can use it to just nick off the odd little micro transient here and there. But if you're digging into the RMS of the signal, like I'm doing here, horrible, hot garbage, loudness done wrong. Okay. And unfortunately, I saw a YouTube video where somebody was advocating just crushing your entire output of your song into the red on your master. And all that's doing is non-oversampled hard clipping. It's the same thing that's happening in this clipper, except I am using oversampling, 4X oversampling. Um, and it just violates everything I think is uh, prudent <laughs> about music production. It violates getting loudness in your mix versus uh, doing it at the mastering stage. Mistake. And then it uh, doesn't appreciate that the harder you run clipping, which is distortion, absolutely producing horrible distortion you can hear on the bass. Like, listen to the bass, okay? When the bass hits come in, listen to that. It's, it's just a horrible distorted mess, okay? You lose all the cleanness of, of the song. So a clipper is not the tool to use here. And the other thing that it's doing is when you run a complex signal, like your full master, into a single band, especially a single band distortion stage, and a clipper is a distortion device. It's, the gain reduction is a side effect of clipping. A clipper is a distortion device first, and gain reduction is a side effect of that. A limiter is a gain reduction device, trying to do that as cleanly as possible. And any distortion that happens is a, is a byproduct. It's not the primary focus. So limiters and clippers are very different animals in that respect. Okay. And uh, when you run a complex signal like a full master into a single band clipper, you get intermodulation, which is producing non-musical sum and difference partials that are um, up in the frequency spectrum, but also can be below the fundamental frequencies of the sounds coming into it and produce this super um, muddy, low frequency garbage. Okay, so running anything into your master on, in the red is just uh, a, I mean... I, I don't even understand how someone could conceive of that as, as a music production technique. I mean, at the very least, use a clipper on your master where you have some control and you can enable oversampling to reduce aliasing. But uh, I think it's a huge mistake to use a clipper in this case. I use clippers in my mix, individual sounds. Then I use them on my buses. And then if I just nick and tuck a couple things on the master, that's how I use a clipper, okay? And then you, I let the limiter take care of the rest of the work. Nice. So uh, with all that said, Let's go back now, and I want you guys to listen to each one of the limiters again. And I want you to listen to the differences between them. And it really helps um, to, to hone your ears in on and try and just listen to the bass. Then try and just listen to the kick drum. Then try and just listen to the snare drum. What's happening to its envelope? Does one limiter make it sound suppressed and quiet? Does one limiter make it sound louder? I want you to listen to the high end, the hi hats, the um, the high end of the song and the basses. Listen to what's happening there. Is it bright? Is it dull? Does it sound harsh? And then especially, I want you to listen to the side channel of the mix, where all the reverb tails and the wide hits are, and listen to what each limiter is doing to the the sense of stereo field and the sense of spaciousness and envelopment in the mix. Okay, and I'm going to go back and forth between uh, these different options. Listen with that in mind. Okay. Drop me some info in the comments. Let me know what you're hearing. Which limiter do you like the sound of best? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm hearing. Okay. So I feel like the sound of Pro L2 and Ozone Maximizer are uh, more similar. And uh, that's typical of what I find with single band limiters. They sound quite similar to each other. And usually the reason why I've gravitated towards Limitless is because it sounds more open to me and it sounds a bit smoother in the high end. 
Uh, that could be by virtue of the fact that it's multiband. I don't actually know what's causing that difference, but in this case, I prefer the sound of Limitless to the sound of Pro L2 and the sound of Ozone. I'm going to let you listen to them again in a second. I want you to see if you can hear what I'm hearing. And uh, I'm listening in headphones right now, but I, I monitored everything on my mains, my Neumann KH420s, and, and that's where I made these kind of judgment calls. Um, so when I listen to Pro L2, it just feels like everything gets a little bit more closed in. It's not necessarily bad. You might like that sound. I just don't, subjectively. Um, Limitless sounds more open. It sounds a bit more smooth and sparkly. I definitely notice the openness in the side channel, the reverb tails. So, so listen for that stuff. And then I notice that same sense of kind of closing in and contained sound in Ozone Maximizer. It does actually have a, a benefit, which it makes everything sound kind of tight, um, which is which is maybe going to work for you in, your, in your song. But I also find that when you listen to the kicks and snares, it makes them feel a bit more contained. Uh, whereas I feel like the kicks and snares have a bit more room to breathe. They sound actually a bit bigger in Limitless, and they sound a bit over compressed and, and tight and contained in Pro L2 and in Ozone. Okay, so let, let's have a listen with that in mind. Okay. Yeah. Let me know uh, if you're hearing what I'm hearing or if you hear something different. Um, yeah. So now I'm going to go back and forth. So I, basically, if I was limiting this track in a mastering setting, I would exclude Pro L2 at this point, and I would exclude um, Maximizer from Ozone at this point, because I like the sound of DMG Limitless better. Um, now what I want to do is I want to compare DMG Limitless back and forth with the multiband spectral version of ozone so i'm going to go irc4 modern okay and that's going to be a uh, a spectral form of limiting now we can go back and forth between and kind of hopefully get a more apples to apples comparison okay <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Again, what do you guys think? Um, I still am liking Limitless. Um, I'm hearing the high end is a little bit different. It just sounds a bit. Ozone's Maximizer still sounds just a little bit constrained to me, and and Limitless just feels a bit more open. It feels honestly, it feels less compressed. Uh, I think maybe that's what I'm liking about it. It just feels like everything has a bit more room to breathe. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, now let's go and check out uh, Sonable, the smart limit. And because you can't, uh, at least I haven't figured out how to turn off True Peak Limiting, I'm going to try and do an apples to apples comparison. I'm going to turn on ISP in uh, Limitless, which is their version of True Peak Limiting. Okay. And uh, so now let's, let's compare these two limiters and go back and forth. <laughs> I'm having a harder time choosing <laughs> between these ones. They they sound a bit more comparable to me. Um, yeah, I'd have to really go back and forth. What do you guys think? Which one do you like? Um, yeah. I mean, I think those of you out there that are not um, wanting to spend a lot of time on limiting or mastering, Smart Limit's going to be a really easy one for you to get to know because of the fact that you can have it learn. Uh, and, and Limitless is, even though I've shown you inside of it, it's, it's a more complicated animal, okay? 
So uh, each one's different. Uh, but now I want to come down here and I just want to show you because the Sonable Smart Limit actually has these other features that none of the other limiters have, at least not like this. And they, they actually give you some like tone shaping and, and other controls. So I just want to breeze you through that real quick. So saturation, what saturation does is it inflates low level material without touching the peaks. So it's kind of like uh, upwards compression. It will be maybe similar to what you see on the Schwab Digital Gold Clip. The gold parameter is doing that too. There's no attack and release on that. It's just inflating low-level material without the potential side effects of oh, how a compressor reacts. And uh, it's also similar to what a Sonox inflator does. Okay, so let's listen as I turn that up. I don't always want to inflate low-level material, but let's listen to what it sounds like. <laughs> I mean, you can see it's radically increased our loudness, but without touching peaks by ramming them further into a limiter. I mean, that's neat. However, um, with this genre, because I'm using so much clipping in my mix and saturation and things like that, a lot of times I'm not wanting to inflate low level material because that makes it sound over compressed and blown out. In fact, a lot of times what I'm trying to do throughout my process after my clippers is I'm trying to actually suppress the low level material. I'm trying to create a bit more expansion really into the into the signal so that the whole thing doesn't sound over compressed uh, so definitely it sounded super blown out to me at 100 percent. but like nudging a little bit of it in i mean the other thing to consider is i'm not mastering this as loud as the vast majority of drum and bass tracks in the genre are uh, a lot of drum and bass tracks are negative four luffs in the drops or even louder in some cases uh which i think is just um uh, a bit excessive <laughs> so um if you're looking for that and you don't want to change the other settings you can literally just turn up the saturation and you're going to get a louder song okay turn that off again um balance is going to introduce um some spectral stuff that's going to be uh taming resonances okay and uh you can you can definitely um use that but it's also going to run the chance of re-eqing your master so let's just listen to what that sounds like okay i like it without it in this mix because uh I have very carefully dialed in the spectral balance of this mix, and I feel like it's taking away um, by trying to suppress some of the things that I actually want to spring up in the mix, like some of the growls in the bass and and stuff like that. Like those are could be perceived as resonances by the algorithm, but but I don't want to tame those because that's what's making the mix sound good. Okay, so uh, use this with caution. Um, I don't usually like doing stuff like this at the mastering stage, but if you have some resonances in your song and you turn this up and you start to hear like a cleaner, smoother sounding mix, that's great. It's great to have this tool at this stage. Okay. So I like that it's there, but use it judiciously. And then we have bass control. So bass control, um, is going to add, uh, some oomph to the bass. It says tighten as well. Uh, and again, this is one of those things where there's some stuff going on underneath the hood that you don't necessarily know what, what it's doing. Uh, the tool tips help. So let's have a listen. Drum and bass, maybe we do want to enhance the bass. Let's let's see what it sounds like. Okay, let's uh, load this into a new slot. And then let's take that down so we can really just flip back and forth with the bass control on and off discreetly. Yeah, that's neat. I like that. Um, I'd have to really carefully monitor this against reference tracks to hear um, the the bass level because it is bringing the bass up more uh, to make the final judgment call on whether or not I like that. But uh, I mean, I'm assuming if you've stayed and watched this video this long, you like drum and bass. Let me know what you think. Do you like it with the bass amped up or do you like it a bit more clean sounding? Right on. So there we are. There's our run through all of these flagship limiters. 
If you want to check them out, I've dropped links below this video to each one of those limiters. And where to go next? I have an entire playlist all about limiters, these, these uh, different limiters that I like to work with, how I use them, best practices, settings in each one in different genres. I have that video called How Modern Limiters Actually Work. All those videos are in a playlist. I would definitely encourage you to check that out next. There's a link below the video and up in the cards and uh, go check that out next. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I have made a really big shift in what I'm doing. I used to build paid online courses at Warp Academy and charge money for those. I really just want to reach more people with this work. I want to maximize my impact and putting things behind a paywall isn't the best way to do that. I started off on YouTube in 2009 just offering knowledge for free uh, because I wanted to share it when I learned something useful. However, I want to make this my full-time thing. I want to increase the amount of high quality free videos that I'm putting on YouTube. And in order to do that, I could use some support. Now, not everybody's in a financial position to help me out with that, but if you are and you get value out of these videos, I'd like to ask you to click the link below and I put some subscription plans in place there that are kind of like Patreon on Warp Academy, anywhere from like nine bucks a month and up, if you have the means to support me in creating more videos like this. And I would absolutely massively appreciate that. If doing a monthly thing is in your, is in your bag, um, even below this video, there's a super thanks button where you can toss me a couple bucks as a one-time, hey, thanks for the video thing. I would, I would greatly appreciate that. Beauty. Okay, if you're not subscribed to the channel yet, please do stay in touch. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked this. And uh, like I've said many times in this video, I want to hear from you. I love hearing from you guys. Drop me comments. Let me know what you thought about this one. Much love, happy music making, and I will catch you soon. Cheers.